to the upcoming Fall Festival next Sunday, October 24th. It'll take place following the fall, the pet blessing at four o'clock and we'll start around 4.30. So feel free to wear a costume, come as yourself. It's for kids, for adults. Invite your friends, your families, your neighbors and coworkers. And you can come and decorate your car. Um, it'll be a trunk or treat so you can pass out dog treats, candy for the kids, and we'll have prizes for um, the best decorated car. We're also gonna do a chili cook-off, so put your best chili recipe together in a crock pot, and we will all vote and taste test the chili. So it's gonna be a good time, um, lots of games, cornhole, um, games for the kids, face painting, and also pumpkin decorating. So we hope that you can all come. If you're interested in volunteering, feel free to reach out to me. There is an insert in your bulletin with my contact information. And if you're willing to volunteer, if you can be available around three o'clock that day to help set up. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. It is uh, good to see everyone here today and online. For those of you who are joining us either on this Sunday morning or at some other time during the week, Last week, we talked about God's provision, providing manna in the wilderness uh, to the people of Israel as they traveled. And so hopefully you've been looking for manna or God's goodness uh, to you during this week. And then today, we're going to jump way ahead and hear about God's call uh, to a young boy named Samuel. And uh, so we're going to learn about Samuel and what it means for God's call uh, in our life. So let's greet the Lord in prayer and then uh, in song. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day to worship, for those that are here in person, for those that are um, watching and worshiping from the, the comfort of their own homes. Lord, we thank you for the, the coffee and the donuts and the bagels that are outside, and we thank you for this opportunity to worship. And so no matter what's happened to us this past week, Lord, we come here knowing that you are calling us and loving us. And so we give you who we are now. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I'm Pastor Margo. Uh, last week, we read about the Israelites at the beginning of the wilderness journey, the story of Moses, and about how they were learning to trust God and to live in God's kingdom ways. After 40 years, they stood on the banks of the Jordan River and crossed into the land that God had promised them. It took some time to settle down, and there were many conflicts and mistakes along the way. There was no leader, there was no king, and each person did what they wanted or felt what was right for themselves, and the situation deteriorated over time. The people forgot what they learned about being God's people. God then raised up judges to be leaders who reminded people of God's ways, but really they only had limited success. So, by the time we get to today's story, the people had built a shrine to house the Ark of the Covenant that they had brought during their wilderness years. And there was a seer or a priest of some sort there, not exactly a judge, not exactly a prophet, but someone who could help conduct worship and interpret God's word to God's people. And his name was Eli. And he had become something of a mentor or foster parent to a child. His name was Samuel. This child's mother, Hannah, had promised him to the service of God in this shrine. And that brings us to our story today and the scripture about Samuel and Eli and God. 1 Samuel 3, verses 1 through 10. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose, uh, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. 
And he said, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. May God bless this reading of God's holy word. So last week when we were uh, talking and, and we were with the Israelites out in the wilderness, there were some things that we, that we discussed that we know are, are just relevant for us each day and, and throughout every week of our lives. And, and we know that sometimes changing, being asked to change, being asked to trust, being asked to to follow God as they were out in the wilderness can be scary and challenging. And so we talked some key things from last week, just to refresh your memory, that uh, people prefer the misery they know to the mystery they don't know. So sometimes we're willing to stay in our own misery and junk versus stepping out into something we're unsure of and uh, as we talked, you know, it takes faith in order to do that. And sometimes our present anxiety distorts our memories of the recent past. And so we will often want to cling to things that, that we think were the best instead of, again, always believing in and depending on God, that God is leading us into new things that provide for us a more fuller life. As Jesus says in John 10, 10, I've come that you might have life and have it fully. And so in the wilderness, we know also in the wilderness is usually a place where something is ending in our life and then something is in beginning. So we're in this wilderness, this unknown area that can seem um, very troubling for us, but it pre pre presents a time for us again to grow in our faith, this foundation of understanding who God is in our life. And then what's exciting is that God is redefining your wilderness, this wilderness you're in. God is leading you, pulling you, moving you, calling you through that, redefining your wilderness, never ever just leaving us there. And so we remember these things again, and, and the Israelites are, are, are out, and now we're, we've come to a place where it's called Shiloh, and there's sort of this tabernacle, a more permanent place that's been set up in in there is the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was the box that was moved around that represented uh, the physical location of God. Now, there's a lot that goes into the Ark of the Covenant. We've seen a movie about it, right? You know, Raiders of the Lost Ark. But if we come back again, the Ark was extremely holy, and it was put in the Holy of Holies. Um, and this is where we find young Samuel sleeping, Eli, the mentor, the older person, was outside of this place. And so it's interesting to think about why was Samuel sleeping next to the ark? Like the holy of holies, but there he is. Now, he had kind of grown up in the church. Maybe no different than when our youth have an overnighter, right? And they sleep wherever. They sleep in the sanctuary on the pews. And, and you know, no different. Now, if you've not really read your Bible much or much in the Old Testament, I would encourage you to read the books of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. There is a lot of stuff going on, great, great stories. We're going to be into King David next week, but there's just a lot of things happening. Just in the first couple chapters of Samuel, we get to learn about 
Samuel's mother, Hannah. Now, Hannah and Penaniah were married to Elkanah. There's a lot of Hannah endings on all three of those names, kind of like our own Hannah. Yes. So, in fact, Luke, in writing the Gospel of Luke, uses Hannah's song to create Mary's song, or the Magnificat that we always cover right around Christmas time or Advent time. Because what Hannah does, Hannah's barren, she can't have children, she really wants to, so she's crying to, to, to the Lord, I want to have a kid. In fact, she's there at Shiloh, and Eli, the, the priest seer guy, sees her and thinks that she's drunk as she is praying fervently. And he's like, woman, have you no shame? Da, da, da. And she's like, I'm heartbroken, I'm praying that I might have a child. So God hears her prayer, and she says, God, if you hear my prayer, and, and if you do allow me to have a child, I will dedicate him as a Nazarite to you. And so she does. Once he is you know, about three years of age, she comes to Shiloh and gives Eli this little boy to grow up within the temple uh, uh, in service of the Lord. And that's kind of where we, again, arrive at this story. And so here's Samuel, and Samuel hears God call out to him. Now, how many times did God call out to Samuel? We think three, but it's four. Because he went, because Samuel goes to Eli three times, and then God calls once more. Yeah. Now, Eli, there's a lot going on here. And I, I, let's go back to some of the original text, and I'm going to finish reading uh, the, through, the, through the end of the chapter. Now, the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. So he's being mentored, he's being groomed, he's being taught. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. And so what we see is that for whatever reason, God has not been speaking to the people through Eli. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. So here we have sort of a physical description that Eli is losing his eyesight, but also that, again, he is not seeing as the Lord wants him to see the visions that God wants him to have. So he was lying down in his room outside. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. Now, in the Holy of Holies, there would have been a lamp that was lit from dusk until dawn. And so this, this lamp had not yet burned out. So we know that it's early morning, just before the sun is to come up, when this starts to happen. <clears throat> Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the Ark of God was. Now, in other stories of the Ark of the Covenant, what happens if you touch the Ark? You die. Yeah. So then the Lord called out Samuel, Samuel, and he said, here I am, and he ran to Eli. Now, we can almost picture the scene. God's like, Samuel, Samuel, right? Or does he say it in the big God voice? Samuel, right? I don't know. I mean, I can't think it's like, hey, Samuel. Now, Samuel's never heard from God. So he goes into Eli and he says, Hineni, right on the front, here I am. Now, this here I am, Hineni, is the same here I am that we talked about when um, Abraham and Isaac were going up and, and God offered uh, Abraham to off sacrifice his son Isaac. Here I am. And we talked a little bit about what that means. It's, it's not just like, hey, here I am. It is, here I am. I am in relationship with you. I am part of your family, your community. I am agreeing to partner with you. Here I am, fully committed. So Eli, we can all imagine this, right? His parents being woken up during the night. Hey, um, I didn't call for you. Go back and lie down. So the Lord called again, Samuel, goes back and Eli did it. So finally, Eli, because again, the, the words of the Lord were, was rare, realizes that this is God calling Samuel. So he says, go lie down, and if you hear from the Lord again, say, speak, for your servant is listening. So Samuel goes, lay, lays down. Now, I wonder what was going through Samuel's mind. Like, wow, you know, is God calling me? Was he nervous? Or what? We don't know, right? So, so the Lord says, Samuel, Samuel, and he says, speak for your servant is listening. All right, now here's where it gets a little bit um, 
not so quite a nice children's story. Those first 10 verses are really used as, as, as a calling, and, and not only a calling for people going into the ministry, but just a calling for people to go into to service of God. And, and it's, it's a great story for us to understand and for young people to understand. That's why we read it before the kids leave for Sunday school, is because we want them to know that the God is calling not just you know Eli, who was, you know, should in today's terms, we think of, well, that's who God would want to speak with, the leader, the one who's been there. No, God's calling someone younger, someone uncredentialed. Now, in, verse, in chapter two, before the story began, an unknown prophet comes to Eli and says, Eli, things are gonna go bad for you. I'm paraphrasing, okay? Because Eli had two sons, Phineas, not Phineas and Ferb. <laughs> I, I knew you were thinking it, right? Phineas and Hoff, Hophni, okay? Had these two sons. Well, what these two sons were doing was very blasphemous to the Lord. So they were taking the best of the offerings. When people would come and offer the offerings, they would take the best meats before giving it to the Lord, and they were messing around with, uh, fooling around, that type of thing. You get the drift, you know, with people at the temple and just disgrace. And, and Eli had tried to talk with them and tried to stop them, but that didn't work. They kept going. And so this unknown prophet is, unknown messenger of God comes and tells Eli, you and your children um, will die and there's nothing you can do to stop this. There's no offering to overcome it. This will happen. So verse 11, let's pick up there. So then the Lord says to Samuel, and again, he's probably 12 or 13 at this time. See, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears it, hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I've told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. So Eli was aware of it, but he just couldn't stop them. Eli didn't do the necessary things to make them stop. He didn't kick them out or even worse, um, you know, to, to stop them from what they were doing. And Eli himself was not guilty of the sin, but he didn't stop it. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Now, expiated means like atone for or allow the, an offering to, to nullify it. So Samuel hears this like, hey, this guy that's raised me, um, God is gonna bring severe punishment, death to him. So Samuel, verse 15, lay there until morning, right? Could you really go back to sleep after that? God has just spoken to you. Oh, wait a minute. We, we, I missed something. Go back to verse 10. Now the Lord came and stood there. That's a key thing, like we, we, we can miss. Look at that. He stood there. So whether God was visible before by, behind the Ark of the Covenant, I, I don't know. But then he stood there. So we have what's called a theophany, like the divine presence uh, to a human. So Samuel is hearing and seeing this form of God. And that's all we know. We don't know what sort of uh, form he, he looked like at, at that moment. So Samuel lay there until morning, and then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, right? I mean, I think we're all, we would be nervous too, right? To say, hey, uh, it's not really gonna go like you think it's gonna go, Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. And may God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me uh, of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. So you've just been told that you're going to die, that your sons are gonna die. 
And I think it's a model of faith at this point because he says it's, it's the word of God. Let God do what God believes is good to God. We've played our part. We've done, done what I've, I could. And this is in God's hands. There's something bigger going on. Let God do what God knows is good. Verse 19, this is a pivotal part here. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. So at the beginning of this chapter, Samuel is a young boy. At the end of the chapter, he's an adult. And God is now speaking to him. And so what we have here is the legitimizing, authorizing of Samuel to speak on behalf of God to the people of Israel. So none of his words fell to the ground. What he said bore, bared fruit. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. And the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So here we have this. And what's interesting is if you read on is that the um, Philistines come and they attack the Israelites. The Ark of the Covenant is taken away. And in that battle, Phineas and Hophni are killed. When the word comes back to Eli that um, his sons are, have been killed in battle, he falls backwards out of his chair, breaks his neck, and dies. Interesting description in the Bible. He falls back, breaks his neck, because he was heavy, is what it says. So, a lot of good stuff in the Bible, they just, you need to read it um, and to get this picture. And so we think about this and what's happening here. So we're like, okay, how does this fit into to what we're understanding? So what we see is there's a, there's a pivotal point in the history of Israel where the, this loose federation of tribes the, of Israel, they're under what we might call a theocracy where God is speaking to prophets to them, to lead them and guide them. And there's a series of judges that are out there judging over them, trying to bring justice. Well, the people look around and they see all their enemies have these great kings. And they say, give us a king. We want a king. Well, Samuel's gonna be like, nah, you don't really want a king. I don't think you understand what a king's all about. And like, no, we want a king. And so that's where Samuel comes in, in this transition so we see where God is using Samuel to speak in this time of transition. But we also see is that if we were to put ourselves in this moment, Samuel becomes, comes called into action during a time of political unrest, social unrest, a time where the religious center is a mess. Every, you know, it's probably as bad as it could get for people. And God says, I'm gonna do something new. I'm gonna bring about a hope for a beginning. So that when people hear of it, it will make both their ears tingle. So we have to understand this and remember this, that as we are being called, as we see God moving amongst others and calling other people, or we in ourselves are in times of turmoil in our life, that God is calling up somebody, even you, to bring about a beginning, a hope. And so we could see here that it wasn't Eli who was speaking. It was Samuel, someone who, who still had a lot to learn. It was Samuel who people didn't expect. It was Samuel, the young one. I mean, you know, Samuel, if it had almost taken in, in church terms, it was like Samuel wasn't even baptized yet. Samuel hadn't served on committees for a number of years yet. Like, you know, Samuel hadn't helped set up 20,000 tables and chairs yet, right? Who's this young guy, Samuel? So Samuel, what happens is Eli was there operating sort of this ritual center. And with Samuel became, became once again a spiritual center a place where God was moving and active in the people's lives. And so here we have where Samuel comes in, he says, here I am, speak, Lord. 
here I am. And, and, and what we see in this Hebrew again is that Samuel was fully present and committed. Now, what does that mean for us? If God were to call you, ask you to do something, it could be big, it could be little, it could be something for the week, it could be, could be something for the summer, but God's calling you, leading you. Do you say, here I am. I'm fully present, I'm fully committed. Rabbi David Cohen talks that um, on occasion, God has said to Adam, to Abraham, to Moses, where are you? And they respond, here I am. Now God knows where they are, but God's asking, where are you? I'm calling you, I'm calling your name. You see, in all this, God knew Samuel's name. Samuel hadn't done anything. He didn't go out and win any great wars. God knew his name. That's the little boy, Samuel. And so what God asks when he says, where are you? It's perhaps it's more along the lines of, where are you in your moral decision making? Where are you in how you apply your life? Where are you in how you make decisions? Where are you in your commitment to following me. Hineni means here I am, ready and waiting to do your will. Here I am, a partner with you in this eternal covenant between you, God, and the people. And so Rabbi Cohen says, and challenges us, how can I fulfill my role more fully? When we say here I am, it means that we're part of a community. Not just ourselves, we, we, we've, we've talked for years about in this calling and then these blessings that we receive from God in, in this leading, the God is always about you in relationship with others. The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Like neighbor, relationship, in community. So here I am means I am in community in partnership with you. Here I am. Now, there's another big thing here, too, which is, well, if here I am, are we, as a, as a church, as, as a body of believers, as a community, are we ready and willing to say, or to listen, like Samuel, to listen to the voices of others, to voices that we may not expect, that we may not think are, are, are ready to be voiced? Like, what do we hear from the young people in our life and in our church what do we hear from the new believers? What do we hear from the 20-somethings? And when we hear them speaking, are we willing to, you know, to let them speak and to be and to do? Now, I think we're, we're pretty on track here in this, in this church. We've always been about, you know, our, our mission over method, the mission of following Christ, of, of teaching the word, a mission about being out and helping others, and the methods in terms of how we worship changes. We're willing to let go of some methods because if we look at everything we've done in the past leads us up to where we are now. And some of that could be helpful, life-giving, and some of it may be, you know, maybe we need to let go, to stop doing it. Maybe we need to stop saying, well, where are all the young, young people? Why aren't they here doing this? Because what we're really saying is, I like the way I've done it, and now somebody else needs to come over and do the chores of the church and do things the way that I've done it and take care of me. I don't know. See, what Samuel did when he was called by God, you know, this uh, words, prophecy that he had to say against Eli, that was pretty tough. Samuel did what Samuel needed to do. He said the things that needed to be said. Eli didn't. Are we always willing to say the things that need to be said? Paul 
Paul, the Apostle Paul writes in Philippians 2, he says, therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That means dig into what God is calling you to do, understanding this, this, who this Jesus is. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. pleasure. God is calling evil care. God is calling into your life. We can't make God magically appear to us. So what do we do with this visions and ideas, this sense of calling that God is given? board meeting or they'll come to me and say, you know, we ought to do this. We ought to have this ministry. We should do this. I'm like, that's a great idea. Why don't you lead that? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I'm like, you know what? I, I can't do it. God obviously called you, put that idea on you. I would love to support you. I would love to find other people to support you, but you have this idea from God. It wasn't somebody else. You know, last week we talked about how, how you know, this, this vision that we have, and I said, you know, I said to God in prayers, reset my vision. And then we have this story again about Eli with lack of vision, not being able to see in this calling. So it makes me think, okay, what is God doing in this church? Who is God calling? Who is God bringing up? What new visions are we being asked to see and to put forth and to put into action how are we understanding that you know, maybe we need to let some things go and move out into this mystery, into this wilderness? And then I see it getting to just this personal level. Here I am. Here I am, Lord. Am I fully committed? Am I fully ready to be a partner? Am I fully ready to, to step forward in whatever it is? And you know, maybe there's some things this is dealing with First, maybe something in your own life and you're in the relationship with your own family or something at school or something at work. Not just here. If we just took care of ourselves in here, that'd be great, but I don't know. We're supposed to be this light, salt out into the world to be with other people. And so when we get the sense of here I am and here I'm committed, I think there's people watching. I think the world's watching. I mean, we know anybody can watch us on live stream. But I think new people watch us. I think our kids and our grandkids watch us. So when we say to Jesus, like, here I am, you're my, you're my savior, forgive me. I'm a follower, I'm a believer in you. When we say, here I am, I agree to that. That involves some spiritual transformation, some social transformation, some change in your life. That's what it involves. Now, you don't have to. You can sit there being the same old you. But people are watching. Is something working in our life. Now, I'm not asking you all to be saints by next Sunday. Right? I mean, because I mean, we all mess up every day. But is there this willingness? Like, I was going to hand out today these sheets of paper that said insurance policy. And when you opened it up, um, you could check the box. Um, here I am. I'm transforming. Or no, I just paid my premium. It's my insurance policy, so I don't go to hell. But then I chickened out. But you get the point. Every Sunday, every day, whenever you're listening to this, the God is calling and moving in our life to, to move and to change and for, for us to say, you know what? Yeah, I don't need to do that anymore. God's calling me in a different way. Amen.